Greetings once again, this is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Uh, today's talk focuses on a class being taught or, or taught at Stanford by J.B. Stroibel, the CTO of Tesla, and uh, some of the data points that were shared by one of his students. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. In case you stay strong, I'm all sidebind and stradasviche nihal ma. My talk today is concentrated on uh, the chief technical officer um, for Tesla, J.B. Strobel. He has two degrees from Stanford, an undergraduate and graduate degree, kind of focused on, I believe, electric, you know, electric. It, it has a lot to do with what he does. I can't exactly remember the term, but it is an engineering degree and it has a lot to do with electric. So I have a, a kind of a new mentee and he's an electrical engineer from Stanford. And it just so happens that he actually took J.B. Strobel's class, I think within the last year, year and a half. And I asked him to sort of share, you know, in general, what were the, some of the biggest takeaways. And um, the main takeaway he had from that is a concept called um, the, the duck electricity curve. So that's the focus of our talk today is what is the duct electricity curve and you know what's its implications. So I wanted to share that even before having the conversation to review what this is about, there's this mystery that's been in my mind for the last let's say six months to a year and that is that there's a uh, the CEO of a, a place called San Diego, California's electric utility made a comment that as we make the transition to solar panels, what they were noticing is that um, if you ended up with, with clouds rolling in or something like that, the forecasting that they had for how much power would be produced by coal or gas totally changed. And so it created a huge nightmare because now you had to use peakers or, or peaker plants to come on and fill the electricity gap not available by those homes producing electricity. So as we get into this conversation of what the duck curve is about, this kind of blends into it. So what the duck curve is involved in is the fact that what happens is that during the day, if you have a, most of the power uses is during the day. The challenge is that based on how the sun moves across the sky, at approximately two o'clock p.m., the amount of solar power being produced by the, um, So the amount of solar power being produced by the um, solar panels on homes starts to decline at approximately 2 p.m. based on where the sun is. And it so happens that by 5 p.m. the power being produced by these solar panels um, declines dramatically heading towards zero. And it's right when people head home and start using power. So you end up in this um, curve where the peaker plants um, have to kick in and they have to get ready to produce power to meet the needs of customers heading home at 5 p.m. The nightmare that happens or the challenge that's happening is that the only viable technique for delivering um, So the only viable technique for delivering the peaker power needed at the pace that's starting to come on is actually an electric battery. So what ends up happening is that as the peaker plants come on, they're having difficulty delivering that power fast enough to cover uh, the gap uh, that shows up. So. This is an interesting circumstance because what you're having occur is the fact that now you have um, 
a very serious move on the part of um, particularly Southern California Edison and others. And what's happening is that California and Southern California in particular is sort of a testing ground for solar powered solutions that will be spread around the world. And the problems that are being experienced represents things that are currently being dealt with in the United States um, and particularly Southern California as a test bed, but others are going to see the same problem. And so it's also kind of a reflection of over 20 or 30 years of technology introduction in California. You can almost anticipate the problems that others will see. And in this case, um, that battery solution is fascinating. So the largest place that the Model 3 is going to hit is actually going to be uh, in California, particularly so Southern California. And so the peaker challenge we just described is going to get even worse as we have more um, uh, electricity that, that is being drawn down by the cars in addition to the homes. So I'm bringing all this up because what I've been anticipating or concerned about is what's going to happen when you have thousands of Model 3s hitting the grid? You have a huge problem showing up, which is this is where Tesla energy is going to make a lot of money because a lot of the utilities are going to all of a sudden have challenges um, associated with delivering their, um, they're going to have big problems in terms of delivering um, an answer to a heavier, heavier and heavier demand from customers. And so I think this represents a huge opportunity for Tesla to make money and what you what I'll call creating their own weather. So Tesla now has an opportunity to every time they sell a certain number of cars, they know there's going to be demand for battery. Um, and so they end up creating the problem of a shortage of electricity and they're the solution to the utilities to which they're creating the challenge. So I think there's going to be a lucrative circumstance for Tesla and other providers of battery backup in this forum. Look forward to your comments about the duck curve and J.B. Stroebel. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Um, so my follow-on to this is that, you know, Elon Musk has been vocal usually about every move he makes in small and large ways, but when he decided to buy back in and bring Solar City in as Tesla Energy, I sort of looked at it and I was thinking that this is a nightmare for some customers because what I was anticipating I think is coming true is the fact that um, when you had the whole robber baron era in the United States, the problem you had was for example, there was a monopoly held by John D. Rockefeller when it came to oil production in the United States and that had to be broken up. The other issue was you had very large car companies that made it difficult for new companies to enter, etc. And when I look at Tesla, I potentially see a company that's going to become so successful that antitrust is going to have to look at breaking them up. Because if they have the ability to watch the number of cars they sell into an area, and then that number of cars is going to consume X amount of electricity, they can almost anticipate where there's going to be a duck curve inefficiency and now they can anticipatorily or just after it happens um, work to provide a solution to the problem they created to that utility. So I think it's a, a fascinating circumstance that's coming forward. It's definitely worth considering uh, from a shareholder standpoint it's a great place to keep your, your stock ownership because it shows where you'll make more money uh, because you have a company that is is well regarded. I was told by Andrea Barnes, you know, or the suggestion by Andrea Barnes, the best Tesla analyst out there, was Tesla really wanted to be an end-to-end -end solution. So when a customer needed their car or home charged, they wanted to be able to provide the car, you know, the power wall along with the roof and have a complete solution for the customers rather than just part of that solution. I think that kind of makes sense, but I think that um, their move right now 
relative to the duck curve means that you know Tesla makes a lot of money whether they provide the car or they provide the batteries to be backup power etc they win because of the number of ways they provide solutions when it comes to electricity this is Greg for Tesla fans insight look forward to your comments have a great day and uh, please like and subscribe and tschüss, macht's gut.